Today on Locked On Canadians, it is a Monday mailbag edition. We carry over the mailbag questions left over from last Friday, including should the Canadians target a Bruins goalie? Will they be able to move, quote unquote, Deadwood off this roster? And more. All that's coming up on today's Locked On Canadians. You are Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to episode 883, and as always, we thank you for making us your first listen of the day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, as well as on YouTube. My name is Laura Saba, also known as The Active Stick, and I'm joined by the wonderful Scott Matla of Habs Eyes on the Prize, who I have uh, rearranged his entire weekend um, in order to record today. Scott, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right. Uh, it's a it's a quiet weekend in terms of Canadians news. We haven't heard much of anything really since the end of last week, but we got some AHL signings, and I'm wondering what Kent Hughes is potentially cooking up starting Monday at what nine a.m. I think is the time we set this uh, this summer for Kent Hughes doing things uh, when we're just trying to work at our day jobs most of the time. Uh, it is honestly, I think uh, what's going to happen is we're going to pu- put out this episode on Monday morning, just after midnight. And then at 8 a.m., we are going to get another Kent Hughes signing. It could potentially be Alex Newhook. Uh, in the meantime, I do have to apologize to the listeners for my voice. I am slightly under the weather and it is a Sunday morning, uh, relatively early on a Sunday morning, depending on if your lifestyle includes children or not. <laughs> um, so in the meantime, we've got a couple of... Uh, mailback questions that I wanted to address from like last week and weeks prior Uh, our good friend Randy Hansen and this I like admittedly this was just before the Canadians were able to trade away Joel Edmondson Um, and Randy's question is does it disappoint you that Montreal hasn't managed to move any Deadwood off the roster yet so the thing with it being Deadwood and using that term a little bit lightly here is I look at the way the NHL kind of went going into the draft, going into the deadline and at other times, good players got traded for nothing or bought out even. The fact that the Canadians were able to get anything for Joel Edmondson that they did is moderately impressive. Obviously, it's down from the value that we were quoted at by insiders, you know, even six months ago going into the trade deadline, but injuries, poor performance has an impact on those things. But I look at good players who got bought out, who got traded for future considerations. It's not easy with the salary cap not going up. If the cap had gone up as expected here, I wouldn't have been shocked if Joel Edmondson went for more. I also think the market would have been completely different. Would other players have been bought out? Would other players have been traded? It all It's hard to say. And I think the biggest thing is here is that we need to reassess what we are expecting of some of these other trades at this point. Yol Armia is not going to get anything right now, not with that much time left on his contract, not with the salary cap staying flat this year, unless he comes out this year and is just on fire, you know, like that two week span where he is absolutely unstoppable in all facets of his game, but all the time, you're not going to get much there. Rem Pitlick might get claimed on waivers, not the end of the world. It's a million-dollar contract, variable in the AHL, not the end of the world. And I know a lot of people are going to point to Mike Hoffman. I go, and my thought to that is, better players have been traded for nothing. For the Canadians, I think at this point, they are going to take whatever they can get for him. If they, if someone offers a fifth-round pick, they will take it. And the biggest win out of that is cap space. But I'm not really disappointed because the market demands aren't there. They're just not. And the big hope is that the Canadians can perform moderately well, still not good enough to make the playoffs likely this year, but moderately well enough with guys like Hoffman and Monaghan and Savard, et cetera, that they can, at the trade deadline, they can be the big sellers here, recoup more picks in the draft or current prospects around the cusp of making the NHL. 
the way last season went with injuries and everything else kind of punted the ball down the line a little bit further. I'm not disappointed. I'm frustrated, but it's not that it's Hughes and Gorton's fault. It's the market is not there for these players right now, whether they were on the Canadians or not, the market was just not there for them. Uh, we've got another draft, a draft related question. We have been getting a lot of those uh, very recently. And this one uh, was immediately after the draft and it comes from Steve. And the question was, would you rather have first round, first overall Uri Slavkovsky and first round, fifth overall David Reinbacher or so like, again, the Canadians would have the same positions in the previous draft. It would be uh, first round, first overall Simon Nemitz and first round, fifth overall Matvey Michkov. Are you getting the impression the Habs were drafting for need? So I think it's interesting that um, uh, Steve says the first round, first overall would have been uh, Simon Nemitz, where like in retrospect a year from now, I think it's Logan Cooley that would have gone first. That's kind of my thought too, is that I don't think they were ever going to take right first overall. And here's the thing is Nemitz had a very good season playing for Utica. He had 34 points in 65 games that I am thinking about it a lot more than I, than I initially did when I saw this question. But I, like you said, like you said, I don't think they would have picked Nemitz and I think they would have picked Logan Cooley and I would have been okay with that. As of right now, it's, I think Reinbacher might have a more polished upside than Nemitz does, but I think they're both very good defensemen. And it's, I want to see what Slavkovsky can do with a proper season under his belt. Nemitz pushes that second option ahead for me because I think Mitchkov has a higher skill upside than Slavkovsky does. And that's not a slight at Yuri Slavkovsky at all. And Nemitz, Reinbacher can go either way. And if I look at this, I want to see what Slavkovsky does this year. If he has to go to the AHL just to, you know, get some more seasoning this year, they decide that's the right path, and he lights it up for them, you know, produces at around a point per game there, I, I'm i going to stick with what the Canadians did there. It's just right now, I'm not opposed to the idea of Nemitz and Mitchkov, even if I do think that they would have picked Logan Cooley and then they still would have picked David Reinbacher in this draft one way or the other. I I'm defaulting to the second one just because Nemitz has more of a professional North American sample than Slavkovsky does admittedly predominantly all at the AHL level, which was where he needed to be this year because the devils didn't have space for him really. And Mitchkov just because I think that he has that next tier upside and maybe Slavkovsky proved me wrong this year. And I am hoping he does. So this is not to say that, there's a bad option in either of these. I don't know if they picked for need, but I think they tried to pick people who fit a physical profile for what this team wanted. And Slavkovsky's that. I think Reinbacher is that. Uh, I, I do think you were right, though, Laura. I don't think they were taking right, and I don't think they were taking Nemitz. They were taking either Slavkovsky or they were taking Logan Cooley at first overall last year. Either one I would have been happy with. Um, for right now, I'm picking option B, but I reserve the right to revisit this at the halfway point of the season and see where Slavkovsky is in his development this year. Yeah, I really think Slavkovsky needs a full NHL year with potentially more minutes, fewer injuries, obviously, um, and for him to be paired with different people just to see how versatile he is. And I know, you know, he's supposed to be a top line player. He's supposed to be a top line winger. Um, and I know the Canadians don't want to rush all of that, but I, I do think that there's some value in uh, being a little bit creative this year. And I hate when, when coaches just like throw things in the blender and hope something sticks. I don't think Martin St. Louis is that kind of guy, but I do think that, you know, it's worth experimenting with uh, different lines. And um, we're going to continue. Actually, there's a couple follow-ups to this particular question. And we're going to continue talking about that in the next segment, including where is the offense for this team going to come from in the future? And that's all coming up in just one moment here on Locked On Canadians. But first, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Take your first swing at betting MLB on FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets, up to $200. That's right, just bet 20 bucks and you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. 
that's 200 you can spend betting everything from the money line to the over under to who you think is going to be the first home run all on an app that's safe secure and super easy to use plus when you win you can get paid instantly there's no better place to bet on MLB than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So sign up today and visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, the official partner of Major League Baseball. All right, so there were a couple of follow-ups to the question, uh, and one of them is, where is the offense coming from in the future? The 2024 draft se- seems defense-loaded. Will we reach on offense then? <laughs> You're on mute, I think, Scott. <laughs> it's a nice change of pace. We're just switching the roles for today's uh, <laughs> today's show. Is I haven't seen who is in... Uh, the NHL draft center here. So I'm going to go take a look. And I know the big name is Macklin Celebrini and Cole Iserman, who are both going to likely go in that top five there. I'm just looking at, yeah. And uh, I know Demidov is a name that uh, people are looking for. And then there's also Cole Hudson, because if one Hudson's good and one Cole is great, why not double up on both of those things here at some point? I think Cole Eiserman's going to be the one that I don't think the Canadians are going to finish bad enough to potentially draft him. I, uh, I'm curious to see what they do though. And obviously I don't know anything about this draft class outside of a few names that I learned watching the under 18s and talking to people like Hattie and uh, Sebastian high. I'm not going to pretend to mislead any of you. Otherwise the offense for the Canadians this year should come in one of two ways. One Cole Caulfield will be healthy the entire season, which is a bonus And two, for the love of God, I hope the power play functions at least moderately okay. An average power play, and the Canadians are probably not picking in the top five last year. An average power play this year, where they might be adding more talent. You're going to have Rafael harvey Pinard all year. You're hopefully going to have Yuri Slavkovsky take that next step forward. You're going to have a more offensively-minded defense, because Mike Matheson will not miss a big chunk of this season with a hernia injury. If everything comes together like the two weeks where the Canadians were actually healthy for a hot minute, I think the offense will just naturally increase here too. It, it was a learning year last year for a lot of young guys. I'm I'm not anticipating Mike Hoffman to suddenly return to like 30 goal form. If Mike Hoffman returned to 15 goal form, I'd be happy with that this year. If Brendan Gallagher can stay healthy and be a 20 goal guy. If, 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 if Yol Armia can, you know, pot 12 to 15 goals, a lot of it is just banking on, it can't be worse than the last two years where everyone was injured. Everyone's just kind of struggling to find their roles and rebound. It, it, it's the next logical step forward that this team will just get better at that point. So we've got another mailbag, um, and this was also like shortly after the draft, not immediately after, but shortly after the draft. Can you figure out what the draft strategy even was this year? It's a very deep draft for forward talent, but the Habs ignored all of it in the first three rounds. They traded the chance to draft Kristal and Gauthier in the first and early second. Make it make sense. I, I wish I could. I, I wish I could. And like their first two picks were great. Again, we we loved Jacob Fowler's pick, and we uh, I have no problem with David Reinbacher as a pick here. The rest of it is bizarre. Florian Jekai was a weird pick. Some of the uh, like Sam Harris feels like a reach. Luke Middlestat taking a swing at an overager late in the draft is a thing the Canadians have been doing since Mark Bergevin was here. There's never a bad time for that. At you know 197th overall, who cares? It's not like there was something better, like guaranteed better there. I I don't fully understand it. It feels like they added guys who fit culture, and that's what they talked a lot about afterwards. And I know that it sets off so many alarm bells for so many Habs fans because we spent, what, the better part of a decade hearing about culture and character and all these other intangible things. Hearing it again feels a little bit like a... um, a reversion to that. I don't know if that was their plan or not, or they saw something in these guys that we got to go for that. We got to go for that. We got to go for that. 
I I legitimately don't understand. The goalie thing makes sense because they didn't have goalies in the system there. They they lacked goalie help, and they uh, they went and they found it. And like I've said, they have three tiers. Of, they've got a guy playing in Russia who is probably going to be able to be one of the first people to come over. They've got a guy in the QMJHL. They've got a guy going to college, and they've got Emma Carteau in college. They've got guys coming to the pro ranks. They have multiple layers of goaltending talent now in the prospect pipeline, and they're hoping one of it hits. That I understand. I can't really explain the rest of the draft, and we'll see how like someone like Bogdan Kunieshkov does this year. Had a really strong year last year as a rookie. He signed for three more years with Torpedo now. Let's see where that goes, because maybe, maybe they know something we don't, which is entirely possible. They are the scouts. We are two people with a podcast. Exactly. Um, and, and that's the thing, too, is that like even scouting in itself is not an exact science. A lot of the times when you're drafting, you're drafting for upside that players may never reach. And it could be due to them. It could be due to like, you know, they showed an absurd amount of talent in, in, in like lower leagues, but they just weren't able to translate that game into the professional level. There's all kinds of stuff. But like us as podcasters, we rely on the information that we're getting from the public scouting sphere. So, um, anyway, so we've got, um, we've got another question and this one, uh, again, it, it is about the draft, uh, and it's our good friend, Kevin soon. How would other fan bases react to their team passing on Mitchkov in this situation? Are Coyotes fans as upset as Habs fans about this? So I think it's a bit weird because I feel like the Coyotes also did kind of reach on a large defenseman. They did, and like I, I, I like Dmitry Simashev a lot, and they were going to take Reinbacher. If the Canadians traded down, they were taking Reinbacher. Like that, I think, is very clear. It's just like the Kotkaniemi draft, where they probably wanted Kotkaniemi, and because the Canadians took it, they took the next best center, which was Barrett Hayton. It's a very weird strategy to pick the great value brand of something. But And now with the benefit of hindsight, Mitchkov said out in the interview that he didn't want to go to the Coyotes or to the Capitals for various reasons. Like he had his heart set, I assume, on Philadelphia. I, which, sure, I don't fully understand it, but sure, I get it. He just likes think, gritty that much. Yeah, apparently. Like, <laughs> I don't think Coyotes fans are reacting too negatively just because they've had so many picks. But I... If I were the Coyotes fans and they patched on Mishkov and then they had the draft they did where they just drafted large people the entire time, maybe then I'd be annoyed. I think Canadians fans have their right to be annoyed. If I were Arizona, I'd probably be just as annoyed as well because it seems like they did a thing where they're like, all these people are over six foot three. I'm picking them after patching passing on Mishkov as well, which Simashev would have been there had they traded down and they could have gotten more out of that, which I still kind of wish the Canadians had done. If they don't take Reinbacher, if you take Simashev and you've traded down, you're still fine. But I I don't think Coyotes fans are as upset as Habs fans because they went and had a more competitive offseason in terms of adding bodies, whereas the Canadians are still trying to sell off, like we talked about earlier, dead wood a little bit. Uh, I don't think anyone should really be upset about it because if he didn't want to be there, what are the chances that he just stays until his NHL rights expire and then he goes wherever he wants? Then – then you're mad because you didn't get him signed and that whole process just repeats in a different way. It's always a huge risk with a player like that. I do, like, I think, you know, as time has gone on in the last, in the last week or so, like, I think we've warmed more to the idea that like Mitchkov was never going to work out here in Montreal. Um, and again, we don't know what his upside is, right? Like it's his potential, but does he reach that potential? There's so many players. It's like, do you reach the potential or not? Um, so I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a, it's an interesting question. But we're going to move on to a lot more Twitter questions coming up in just one moment here on Locked On Canadians. All right, Scott, are you ready for more questions from our mailbox on Twitter? Always, 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 always. Always, always, always. So we've got a question about... um, Trading with the Bruins, potentially. All right. So this comes from Dylan on Twitter. Hey, guys. Been floating this in my brain all day now and just dying to know if any other Habs fans think there's any sense of plausibility to it or not. 
The Bruins are obviously still hoping to be competitive for this year and are running back Olmark as their starter. So I wonder if they would be interested in a deal composed of Jake Allen, 50% salary retained, Dvorak, because the Bruins love uh, defensively responsible centers, and a second-round pick for Swayman. Gives Habs a young tandem of Sway and Monty to try out, and it gives Boston some much-needed center depth along with a reliable backup, all all for around what a Swayman contract would likely cost them. Maybe it's a bad trade, but it feels like it makes a ton of sense for both sides. So the hard part about this for me with Jeremy Swayman is how good is Jeremy Swayman and Linus Olmark because the Bruins were a good team and how much of that is they are a very good goalie. And I look at Jeremy Swayman's time with the Bruins, uh, seven and three, 945, uh, 914, 23 wins, 2.41 goals against uh, 2.27, 920, 24 wins this year on the best team in the NHL. It feels very buyer beware that if the Canadians trade for him, they are getting him with the Canadians, not with the Boston Bruins in front of him, not with Patrice Bergeron and Brad Marchand and David Pasternak. With all due respect to the Habs players, they are not that guy. And I don't dislike the proposal there because it does two things. It sheds some of those other contracts the Canadians need to get rid of. I don't think Jake Allen is a contract they need to get rid of for what it is worth, but it moves Dvorak. I don't know if the Bruins say yes, though, just because they want to guaranteed run. They want to try to run it back as best they can, and that includes having Swayman and Allmark there, and I don't know if they say yes that. I wouldn't be intrigued at making that choice. It also depends on what Swayman's contract is going to be valued at. Cause can the Canadians even afford that? Yeah. You're retaining half, but at the same time you want to leave yourself some cap flexibility. Cause if you're going to be adding a bad contract at the trade deadline or something to accrue more picks, you want to make sure you have the space for that. If you're Kent Hughes. And the biggest thing is I don't think the Bruins say yes. Also, Swayman, he started at most 41 games in the season, half the amount of games. Again, playing behind a good team. What happens when you put him behind a young, learning Canadians defense? Is he going to be able to cover for some of those issues? Again, not a goaltending expert, so I don't 100% know, but I would be wary of that at the very least. Uh, Jeff the Red asks, who's most likely to be traded next? Jake Allen? No, Jake. Dvorak. I want to say it's Christian Dvorak, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's Mike Hoffman for like a late round pick just because teams who are missing out on free agents are not able to make their trades and everything right now. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if Hoffman is the next one to go just for a late round pick or like an AHL player or something like that. And like you said, Christian Dvorak just he I haven't heard much about him this offseason, but it feels like the right time that, hey. We're going to go send you a new home here, and we're going to open up that center spot for Alex Newhook or somebody else. Uh, Blaine Potvin, our good friend, asks, which bromance will score the most points, Suzuki Caulfield or Hudson Reinbacher? I mean... It's going to be Suzuki Caulfield. Well, here's the thing about that is, if everything starts off the back end... I, I, a Reinbacher Hudson pairing could create so much out of there, like Petrie Markov used to do. And eventually that finishes with Suzuki Caulfield. And my thing is, like you said, it's probably going to be Suzuki Caulfield. They're going to be much forwards. Yeah. And they're going to be more involved. But I also look at the Canadians' defense, and my thought is a lot of that offense and the power play and everything else will run through Lane Hudson and David Reinbacher at some points because they're very good at moving the puck up the ice. We know Logan Mayu is a great shooter, but that skill translates primarily on the other side of the neutral zone, whereas Hudson and Reinbacher can move that puck up on their own to get in position there. It's a 1A, 1B thing, and no matter what, the Canadians are kind of enjoying the rewards of that overall. Um, And we've got a question from Tim. Will Newhook have the opportunity to play on the Caulfield and Suzuki line, and what would you think about that line? I absolutely think he will. I think uh, th- I think anybody 
will rotate through. You will see Josh Anderson. You will see Rafael Harvey Pinard. You will see Uri Slavkovsky. You will see Jesse Alone. And you'll, they're going to try out as many things until they find a fit. And if the fit stops working, they'll just swap somebody else in there just because that's what they do here. Uh, it's not a bad thing, mind you. Uh, I I just think they're going to go and find what works. So we know Rafael Harvey Pinard worked there. We know Josh Anderson before he got hurt was working there a little bit. I wouldn't be shocked to see New Hook get a run there, but I also think they want to see what he can do at center first. I think one of those games you're gonna those preseason games you're gonna see Alex Newhook taking a lot of reps at center, and then if he's not cutting it, then they'll maybe put him in on the wing somewhere else. It all depends on what happens with Christian Dvorak as well. Uh, we've got a question from Matt on Twitter. What's your best guess on the three D pairings for opening night? Um. <laughs> oh man, I need to look at the Habs uh, uh, roster here real quick because I keep forgetting who's uh, on. Also, uh, we will have a little bit more in-depth conversation about the opening night lineups, uh, and that's coming up a little bit later this week. Uh, this was just one of the mailbag questions because we got we got um, some emails from a frequent listener uh, with you know potential uh, starting lineups, so we thought we'd discuss it with uh, with all of you on a later episode, but this one is just a, what's your best guess? Um, so I think you're going to see Matheson and I want to say probably Gooley together. I think that's a really fun pairing to put together there. Uh, David Savard and Justin Barron. And then I think you see Harris, Jack. I have a uh, Harris Kovacevic in there. It, it's hard. They still have a lot of bodies. They have, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They have eight bodies. Uh, That's a lot. And even if Weidman gets sent to the AHL, you still have likely a prospect like Arbor Jack Guy or a Jordan Harris sitting out, which is unfortunate. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with that. I do think that they're going to try and move. I don't think Savard's going anywhere. I don't think Matson's going anywhere this season. I hope Matheson is not going anywhere this season, considering how well he played last year. Uh, I just know that no matter what, there's going to be some games where your defense, you're going to have a prospect player potentially sitting. It's just the nature of the beast right now because they have too many bodies right now. And finally, we have our nemesis question. <laughs> Which NHL player would fall for the banana orange knock knock joke the longest before finally breaking? Taylor Hall. That was very quick. I've been thinking about this question since we got it before last episode, and I kept coming. Taylor Hall, who, if you haven't seen the uh, him and Eberly playing Hangman uh, up there, or the fact that he failed an open book voter's license test twice, it, it it's it's Taylor Hall. It's too easy to say Brendan Gallagher again, but like, it's Taylor Hall a hundred percent of the time. I like the answer, and I also resent the implication. So last week, Scott decided we were going to do that question on Monday. And <laughs> Will Christ, our enemy, said that the reason he didn't do it is because I didn't get the joke reference. And so that actually made me overthink the joke reference and wonder if it was like from a movie or a book or something that I didn't know. No, it's just a stupid joke. Um, and also, like, we're not 12, Will. I don't even think 12-year-olds <laughs> fall for that. We're not eight. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, that is it for the makeup mailbag for this week. We thank you all for providing us with all of those questions and content ideas. Later this week, we will have a goalie guest. Uh, we also will have uh, early lineup thoughts uh, and all that. Like We still have to discuss Adam Ekstrom. We've got so many guests lined up. And then soon we're going to go down to three episodes a week. But we will still be with you all throughout the year as always so make sure you're subscribed to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts as well as on youtube you can find us on twitter at lo underscore canadians we're working on getting a threads uh you'll find each of us on twitter i'm at the active stick scott is at scott matla and uh you can always email us at lockdowncanadians at gmail.com thank you so much for listening we will talk to you tomorrow